A brief evening to you. Many thanks for joining us on the news at 6 right here on Super Screen Television. Coming to you live from our studios in Lagos, Southwest Nigeria. I'm blessed among the say and now to the report we're tracking at this hour. The Inspector General of Police, Mohamed Adamu, has reprimanded the rank and file of the Lagos State Police Command over unprofessional conduct. The IGP, who is officially visiting the command over for the first time since he assumed office, condemned the misuse of firearms against members of the public, which has resulted in the death of four persons between January and April 2019. This visit has become expedient in view of the recent trend of unprofessional conduct by some personnel who, in alter disregard to their professional training, international protocols, constitutional dictates, the force policies, and ethical standards, have continued to drag the force into acts that pitch pitch us against the citizens we engage or we are paid and statutorily obligated to serve and protect. If you can remember from January to this month of April 2019, Lagos State has recorded four incidents of misuse of firearms which have resulted in extrajudicial killing of young citizens of this country and injury to others. While commending the Lagos State Commissioner of Police, Zuberu Muhazu, and other senior officers of the command for prompt investigation and prosecution of the officers involved in the fatal shooting of citizens, Adamu Ashok that the force is more committed to rid the country of criminally minded individuals. Anybody posted in Lagos as a police officer must be a professional police officer, a hard-working police officer, officers that are dedicated to fighting crime, officers, officers that know what to do to bring down the level of crime in the, in the, in the state. When the level of crime is brought down, to the barest minimum in Lagos, invariably the crime rate in the country is down. And so far, you've done your best, and we have been doing your best, and we'll encourage you to do your best. I also admonish all police personnel to choose this day to rededicate themselves to higher professional standards and to acknowledge that their duty to protect the lives of citizens is sacred and must never be compromised. Against the Boko Haram sect, killing 27 jihadis and recovering arms and ammunition. By spokesman Colonel Shagi Musa, troops of the Section 1 Operation Lafia Dole in a joint clearance operation with. Kajian Defense Forces on the 13th of April 2019 had a fierce encounter with Boko Haram terrorists at the northern part of Wugo, Tumbuma, Chingu, Gudu, and Buka Mayam villages. According to Musa, during the operation, 27 terrorists were sent to permanent discomforting sleep. The spokesman further noted that the coordinated military operation is ongoing, especially in the fringe of Gamburu. Ngala and surrounding area to deal with the flame bondage running out from multinational joint tax force operation OP Yanshi Takful onslaughts their IDOT. Investigation has shown that about 150 people have been killed and more than 12,400 people displaced across 10 IDP camps in Kaduna State. Chairman, Southern Kaduna People's Union Relief and Reconciliation Committee, Joseph Lab, disclosed these when some relief materials were brought to one of the IDP camps in the state. The number of people killed at first instance, uh, from Sokapo, we had a record of 159 men, women, and children who were killed. About 684 houses were burned. In the first instance, uh, during the attack on 10 March 
2019. Unfortunately, last Monday, on the 8th of April, there was an attack again. A total of uh, 27 persons were killed. We are yet to ascertain the total number of households and uh, the value of properties uh, destroyed so far. Uh, we are able to extend our own uh, visit to the station to Mbo, Nandu Sangha local government. Uh, we discovered that during the attack there, a total of uh, eight people were killed and uh, 48 houses were burned down. If you watch them in the National Assembly, that is what they have been saying every day, that this, these people that are there, that are the security in the head, they are not doing well, that they should be changed. But the, 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 the president is so satisfied with them. And people have been killed, killed in Kaduna State, killed in Zamfara, killed everywhere. And these people are there. I don't know how professional they are. And I don't know why you should keep in them. <laughs> you need to test some hands to make sure that these people are able to deliver. These people have failed. They cannot deliver. Why should you be keeping them? People's Union Comrade Anto urged President Muhammad Buhari Most of us here, we are farmers, and the rainy season is far approaching. We want to move back to face our farming activity. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we are, we, we are begging those that no other organization can, take, can talk to them so that we, they can assist us. In our talk in politics, the North Central Elders Forum, NCEF, has called on President Muhammad Bari and the ruling All Progressive Congress, APC, to zone the speakership of the Ninth House of Representatives to the North Central Geopolitical Zone. NCEF Chairman Muhammad Gwaska, who disclosed this to newsmen in Abuja, advised APC to imbibe the traditions of party democracy in line with federal character. With federal character. He queried the insinuation that the Southwest is being considered by the leadership of the APC for the Speaker, saying that he would be very unfair to the North Central, that the NCEF chairman pointed out that the North Central deserved the speakership based on the number of votes it contributed to the re-election of President Mohamed Bari in the just-concluded presidential and National Assembly election. Our call for the leadership to urgently suspend the rumor of zoning speakership to Southwest, but zoning speakership to North Central Zone. Because with the way the zone had been performing politically and otherwise, I think we deserve some due recognition. And I am sure Mr. President himself will listen to our appeal. I am sure the national chairman of the party will listen to our appeal and respect our stand. Still talking politics, a political support group under the auspices of Atiku Presidential Campaign Organization, APCO, has de described the recent presidential election as robbery of the people's mandate. 
leader of the group Abraham Justice. Who disclosed this during a press conference in Abuja said Nigerians have witnessed the worst election in the history of the nation. What transpired on February 23rd presidential election has simultaneously arose many interests across the length and breadth of this state of Nigeria, ensuring that this daylight robbery is not allowed to survive. Another member of the group, Audi Roland, alleged that there were widespread voter suppression in PDP strongholds, and says that there were questionable voter turnout in APC strongholds. Information I received from IRS, intelligence, reconnaissance, and surveillance from my revolutionaries and rebellion warlords in the Niger Delta indicate that Alaji Atiku Abubaka won the election with a very large margin. Whereas the opposition APC, in connivance with the Nigeria upset and dubious desperados in Aso Rock, have decided to thwart Alaji Atiku Abubaka's electoral mandate. The sovereign will of the people, the lawyer is here. In line with section 14, subsection 2A, the sovereignty belongs to the people and they have decided to pervert it. And whereas it is obvious that the APC government and Muhammad Buhari and the, the Dosperados in Asoro, if allowed to continue in office, will lead to Nigeria into aggravated poverty and wretchedness, squalor and misery and preposterous insecurity with the eventual collapse of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Therefore, we in the Revolutionary Council of the Nigerian people, in association with our rebellion warlords in the Niger Delta, and of course the other associates, have decided to draw more forces, activate arsenals, mobilize, and launch effectively, ready for launching. The group called on Nigerians to unite with a view to retrieve Atiku's Abubakar stolen mandate. And in other news now, Nigerians have asked the federal government on the extradition of Nigerians in foreign prisons. They made a call in reaction to the execution of Nigerian Kujurat Afolabi in Saudi Arabia over drug peddling. Super Screen's Precious Amayu tells us more in the support. The estimated number of Nigerians living in diaspora ranges from 5 million to 15 million. While some of them make the nation proud with exploits in their various fields of endeavor, a few of them who are criminally minded make the country an object of international ridicule through drug peddling, card fraud, internet scam, among other crimes. However, in Saudi Arabia, some Nigerians were arrested, with one of them identified as Kudirat Afolabi, executed by the Saudi government over drug trafficking, while more Nigerians are still on death row for the same crime. Reacting on these developments, a lecturer from the North American University, Benin Republic, Professor Simeon Una, and another from University of Lagos, Dr. Austin Inaya, say Nigerians in diaspora must learn to respect the laws of their host country, as they called on the federal government to ensure that criminal activities abroad no longer wear a Nigerian face. Those of us should be aware that um, if you traffic in drug, the penalty is death. So this get rid quick of uh, people should be discouraged. There are some Nigerians abroad that are doing well, but because of the image of few of these ones that commit crime, you know, they, uh, they are being harassed abroad. The green passport is the most suspected passport outside the shores of this country, even in Ghana. There are so many Nigerians that are prosperous in this country without stealing. Government should try to create a enabling environment for business to thrive in the country. In most of these countries, especially like Saudi Arabia, Turkey, you know, all these Asian countries, Muslim countries, they operate Sharia law. And even among their nationals, if you carry drugs, you pay with drugs, they are going to be killed. So it's just a standing rule. The government has an embassy in Saudi Arabia. They also, in the foreign affairs, they can arrange for some legal teams that can go to defend those people and find out and try to investigate whether they are framed or not and defend them to the, I mean, to the letter. For these Nigerians, they tax the federal government on facilitating their extradition to the country for fair trial, while others say they should be allowed to face the consequences of their actions in Saudi Arabia. They should face the consequences over there. The is even stated in their visa. 
that when you carry drugs to this place, this and this will happen. They knew that if they were not set up, if the law is allowed to take its course and they were given fear hearing, I don't believe in sentiment. Supposing that government have provided for them, you know, there will be no all these things. So they're supposed to bring they're supposed to bring them back and try them here in Nigeria. Most of them go into that business. It's not with their mind. It's not with their mind. They're just searching for means of living. I think uh, those guys should face the law because them to know already before they ever go there, try to do those things, they know that Saudi Arabia has a law. And their law is anybody who brings drugs to their country will be persecuted. If a Nigeria can have their way, that they should go and you know, bring all our people that they are in those um, that they were four or fifteen to that to just to bring them back home to Nigeria so that they can uh, be punished no accordingly. It's important to note that when any Nigerian commits crime abroad, he or she is not identified by the ethnicity but nationality. As a result, all hands must be on deck towards enlightening one another on the tenets of morals, values, and being a good ambassador of the country. Precious Amayo, Super Screen News. The Code of Conduct Tribunal, CCT, has fixed Thursday for its final judgment in the charges of force and non-declaration of asset instituted against Justice Walter Nagin, who reportedly resigned as the Chief Justice of Nigeria on April the 4th. The Dan Ladi woman led three man bench fixed the date for judgment after the prosecution led by Ali Uhuma SAN and the defense led by Okun Effort SAN adopted their final address. During the proceedings, the defense, in their final argument, maintained that the prosecution failed to prove the six counts beyond reasonable doubt as required by law and urged the tribunal to dismiss the case. Efforts maintained that the statement made by the Nogin to the Code of Conduct Bureau was not confessional, as alleged by the prosecution. Adjourning the Thursday for judgment, the tribunal chairman said the verdict would be delivered along with two pending rulings on Nogin's application, one challenging the jurisdiction of the tribunal to hear the case and another one asking the CCT chairman to disqualify himself from further presiding over the case for being allegedly by house. And now to Oyo State, now the election petition tribunal in Oyo State has ordered the Independent National Electric Commission, INEC, to allow governor, governorship candidate of the All Progressives Congress, APC, Adebayo Adelabu, to inspect election materials used in the March 9 governorship election. Chairman of the tribunal, Justice Anthony Apovi, said the, he gave the order after considering the application made by Delabu on its merits and felt it would help the petitioners in maintaining their cases against the respondent. He ordered INEC to, for, to allow the petitioners and their agents to inspect and obtain all polling documents used in the March 9th governorship election in the, cost, in the custody of INEC. You will recall that INEC had declared Mark Le winner of the governorship election after pulling 515,621 votes to defeat Adelabu, who scored 357,982 votes. The federal government has been advised to set policies that would address issues of climate change in the country for a cleaner and safer planet. Stakeholders at World Arbiter Leadership Conference aired in Abuja stressed the need to foster deeper understanding of the precarious issues confronting the human habitat in particular. It is in, resp in response to the biting issues and problems of the prevalence of the inadequate and inappropriate attention and endemic issues of the human settlements and the habi habitat that the United Nations created dedicated programs to propagate and engage world governments and leaders in ensuring the enhancement of capacities on issues bordering on the habitat and human settlements. As a nation, we need to make that conscious effort to say we want to go green. And um, if we decide to do that, then we'll probably come up with policies that will support the green agenda. For instance, I proposed a roadmap 2050, where I believe that uh, carbon dioxide emission 
can be reduced by 50% in 11 years, by the year 20, 2030, if we look at it very well. And those are possibilities if we decide this is what we want to do as a nation. Just so watching the news at 6 right here on Super Screen Television. We'll take our first break here, and when we return, we'll bring you business news in a beat. Just stay with us. Many thanks for staying tuned to the News at 6 right on Super Screen Television and our talk in business. The federal government has approved the inauguration of work on the section of the road linking Nigeria with the Republic of Benin. The Minister of Works, Power Works and Housing, Babatude Fashala, will disclose these at the 12th Ministerial Steering Committee, an expert meeting for the Abidjan Lagos Corridor Highway Development Program in Togo, said the project would be done in a flexible way. The minister, who is also the chairman of the ministerial committee overseeing the project, expressed delight that while those who inaugurated the initiative have changed, the commitments to the project had not changed. He described the project as a testimony to the strong bond among the ECOWAS countries to pursue common goals and aspiration to ensure the development of the sub-region in terms of standard of living for the people. The federal government has met with the World Bank over a proposed $1 billion loan for the country's ailing power sector. Minister of Finance Zainab Ahmed, who led the Nigerian team to the meeting with the World Bank power sector team, said the reason the L of the high-level meeting was to discuss the way forward for, propose, for the proposed $1 billion Nigerian performance-based loan. According to her, five years after the privatization, the power sector's narrative has not changed as the protracted challenges bedeviling the sector has yet to be completely addressed. And still on business, opportunities and threats of the liquefied petroleum gas LPG from the discussion at the 2019 LPG West African Summit held in Lagos. Superscreen Malamide Onwuka was at the summit and our report. At the 2019 Liquefied Petroleum Gas West Africa Forum and Exhibition held in Lagos, stakeholders and experts in the sector highlighted factors militating against gas blurring and the general development of the sector in Nigeria and West Africa. While the organizers of the event believe the time is right for the private sector to join hands in addressing the recurring challenges, Others say diversifying the economy and enhancing the potentials of the liquefied petroleum gas are paramount. The objective is to create a platform for the business community to share, network and, and actually exchange information and ideas. So by doing that to promote LPG in the region. We also, uh, during the forum, we also like to bring in many experts around the world. So today as you can see, we have quite a number of top international speaker at this event. So we hope that their sharing will be helpful to, to each country as, your de as you develop your own. We expect that as a private sector that's going to drive this. Uh, government is just going to be an, en an enabler to make sure that the atmosphere is conducive for investments. So Renzo touched on things like uh, uh, cylinders. For cylinders in the gas policy, there's a five-year plan where for the first three years, we expect that importation and local manufacturing Will take place but by the fifth year absolutely 100 percent manufacturing one of the key challenges that is plaguing the gas sector in its entirety whether you're talking about natural gas or you're talking specifically about lpg is the dearth of infrastructure within the lpg uh, frame for instance currently we have a situation where because of challenges with the logistics we are producing lpg in one part of the country we are shipping it down to lagos and then we're trucking it right back to the same part that has a lot of implications for cost and safety and so on and so forth. For the common man on the street, an event of this nature will address the regulation and health issues of cooking gas, which seems to be the major complaint of the industry. President of the Nigerian Gas Association, Audrey Ezigbo, said the event, which is the first of its kind, is holding in Nigeria because of the potentials of the country, especially because it is Africa's leading economy. There's room for LPG utilization even in power and various types of industry. 
and this is where the investment comes in. The terminals, storage facilities, stocking and distribution. Um, I also want to point out the fact that even with the current um, initiatives that the government has on the gas flare commercialization, we expect to see a lot of LPG output out of that. One uh, important message would be to understand that availability of cylinders, so investment in cylinders, and uh, the accessibility of the cylinder and the refill very close home, so you need to have a dense uh, network of uh, outlets or point of sales, whatever you, you want to, to call it, uh, so the refill is accessible. Health is an enormous issue with biomass. Um, currently, from air pollution globally, outdoor air pollution, about 9 million people die every year. This is more than the number of people who die from smoking. In fact, it's more than the number of people who die from war, tuberculosis, and smoking together. This is outdoor air pollution. Indoor air pollution, which is coming predominantly from cooking, is killing over 4 million people prematurely every year. The federal government has enacted the Petroleum and Gas Act, thus providing the necessary support for the private and public sector to thrive. These conferences are expected to hold annually across the selected countries of the world. And away from business, we take another short break now. When we return, we'll bring you following and sport news in a beat to join us again. <laughs>